On today's show, Jalen Green is playing like the best player in the NBA right now. How the Houston Rockets got their huge overtime win against the OKC Thunder. Ten straight wins. Jabari Smith Jr. with the biggest shot of his career. Amin Thompson with a huge 25 and 15 game. It's all coming up right here at Locked on Rockets. This is Mission Control, Houston. Ignition sequence start. Six, five, four, three, two, one. What's up and welcome to another edition of Locked on Rockets, your daily podcast home for everything Houston Rockets basketball. As always, I'm your host, Jackson Gatlin, native Houstonian and credentialed media member. I'm also the host of Locked on NBA Mondays. Be sure to follow along on Twitter at JT Gatlin. The show, of course, at Locked on Rockets, free and available wherever you listen to your podcasts, including YouTube. Now, today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more with FanDuel. Right now, new customers get $200 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. That's 200 bucks if your bet wins. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to get started. And as always, thank you so much for making Locked on Rockets part of your day every single day, whether it's on your way to work, on your lunch break, in the gym. Thank you for being an everydayer and making the show part of your day every single day. Joining us now to break down the biggest game of the Houston Rockets season, the biggest game of the last few years of Houston Rockets basketball is none other than your weekly co-host, NBA draft enthusiast and diehard Houston Rockets fan, Madison Moore. He could track down on Twitter at Madman Leaks. Madison, I know you and I are both so hyped to talk about this game. 132-126 win on the road in Oklahoma City against a very good OKC team, an overtime win. The Rockets, this was the best game that we've had in the last few years, since the James Harden era, I think, as Houston Rockets fans. Yeah, I am very grateful. I mean, we we as Rockets fans put in a lot of time into the development of this team, and right now it's finally paying off with a humongous game, game of the year. You know, a lot has been made about our, our win streak and us playing weaker opponents. Well, tonight we got a good one against the OKC Thunder Barrel on the back of Jalen Green. Now, look, they didn't have SGA. Sure, this is still an incredibly good OKC. And look, the Rockets are missing so many key pieces too. So it's not like it's just lopsided and OKC was just missing their best guy and the Rockets were at full strength. Absolutely not. Jalen Green played like a superstar in this game. Amin Thompson had a huge night, 25 and 15 for him in this game. Dylan Brooks stepped up huge at the beginning of overtime. Jabari Smith Jr. hit his first three. Biggest shot of his career at the end of regulation in this game. So much that we have to talk about from this one, but we got to focus on Jalen Green. He is the man of the hour here. He is playing right now like the best player in the NBA. He's playing like a superstar. He had 37 points, 14 of 24 shooting, 7 of 11 from downtown, 2 of 2 at the free throw line. Only made it to the free throw line twice. We're going to talk about the free throw discrepancy a little bit later on. He had 9 rebounds, 7 assists, 2 steals, 1 block shot in his 46 minutes of play. It felt like Ime Udoka could not take him off the floor. He was a plus 12 in the minutes that he was out there. And, and some of the things that we saw him doing out there, Madison, splitting defender defenders, the insane finishes at the rim, the outside shooting, this what it feels like we've been saying this a lot lately, but this was the best game of Jalen Green's career, period, bar none. This was it. This was like a coming out performance. This was a superstar showing from Jalen Green. And it was about the key moments when this team needed Jalen the most, him, he st- him stepping up like a star to carry his team through rough patches. I mean, for for mainly most of this game, Jalen and Amon were the only players really having a good game. I mean, Jalen, there there was times uh, when uh, the Thunder went on runs and it just felt like, oh, here's this, it's going to get away from us. And Jalen bangs down uh, two threes or uh, goes on a 5-0 run just by himself to keep us in the game. And that was consistent throughout the, the course of this game. This game, OKC game plan to stop Jalen Green. They trapped him at the top of the screen and rolls and made it and made him give up the ball and get off the ball. And he adapted throughout the course of this game and where he figured that defense out completely by the fourth quarter. And he was making plays for everybody on the floor as well as himself. Just absolutely all around game from Jalen Green. Not to mention 
two-way player, Jalen Green. Absolutely amazing on defense tonight. Uh, and, and to put up 37, this amount of offense, uh, offensive output, as well as with the playmaking, and then take it on your sleeve and be the Rocket, one of the Rockets' top two defenders tonight, just incredible performance. And we're really watching the emergence of a star and him just knocking off all the things that, he cap- that he's capable of and stepping up in a big way. Like, I'm just immensely proud of this guy battling through adversity to come out where he is right now and to win this game down the stretch. Absolutely incredible. Look, and you could there were you could maybe write off some of the previous games, right? Oh, bad competition, this, that, the other thing. You can't do that with this Thunder team. But one of the best teams in the NBA, one of the best defenses in the NBA. Lou Dort, one of the premier point of attack wing defenders mm-hmm. in the NBA. And Jalen Green said, you know what? I got this. I'm not worried about it. I got this. Some of the plays that he was making, right? You're talking about the reads. I, I, easily the play of the game has to be the the play at the end of regulation. Rockets get the stop. I'm thinking, oh, Ime's going to call a timeout, right? Draw something up. They, 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 need, they need a bucket. Cool. Absolutely not. They immediately, Jalen gets the ball, guns it in transition, collapses the Thunder defense, draws all of that attention, right? All Every little, all the game planning the Thunder had trying to stop him, drew in so many defenders into the paint, right? And then whips it out to Jabari Smith Jr. in the corner who drains his first three-point make of the evening. Ice in his veins. But that was only possible. That was a huge shot and credit to Jabari Smith Jr. We'll talk about the, the rest of this game and how the Rockets got to that point. We're going to you know, unpack it all here in a moment. But that play was, I think, the play of the game and arguably one of the best plays, if not the best play, of Jalen Green's career because it wasn't just him. He didn't just tunnel vision. He didn't just, you know, in the past, he might have thought, okay, I got to drive up and I got to be the one to take the shot, right? I got to be, no, he understands now his gravity can unlock things for his teammates. And that's exactly what he was doing all night long. The level at which he was using the, the aggressive defense from the Thunder against them, right? Where he was whipping the ball to his teammates. And look, this game would have been a lot easier for the Rockets if guys who were wide open would have just hit some shots. There were a lot of misses from the Rockets in this game. They shot just a hair under 35% from three point land, but there were a lot of wide open threes for guys generated by the gravity of Jalen Green. And that that shot was such a big time shot, Madison. I, I absolutely yeah. lost it when it went in. I mean, it, it was it was immense. I thought it was gonna win us the game there in regulation, yeah, but but I think it still did win us the game because as throughout this game, Jabari really struggled from the field. And not just Jabari, most of the uh the support players, like I said, Jalen and Amon were really the only two players having a good game. And Jalen had been moving the ball, and guys just were not converting. Jalen, I don't know how many potential assists he had, but I could have counted at least three or four in the first half of just wide open uh, opportunities that Jalen uh, created for people, and they just missed. Whether it be uh, Amon had a layup in the second half that he missed, but just but Jalen stuck to the course. He had it going offensively, and he still let his gravity get the other guys on this team involved. And when he hit Jabari for that big go-ahead three, it was such a huge play, but you could feel that trust uh, of his teammates led to Jabari being resurged on defense. Lead, it led to Jabari in that uh, in the overtime hitting another big three. It also led to Dylan Brooks contributing in that overtime because now your teammates are bought in. They feel a part of this game, and that's what playmaking does. And guess what else it does? Now, on the high screen of roll, if you're patient, guys are scrambling back to their assignment because you're making those reads. Now you get the one-on-one matchup you want, and you get to hit them with a nasty step back three to ice the game. You get to you, Oh you, my god, bro, the step, that is step back up three right on Lou Dort was bro. out of this world. Uh, Rockets were up 123-120. It's a three, it's a three-point game. There's not a ton of cushion there, right? But Josh Giddy had just made a bucket on the other end. Jalen comes down, drives it hard on Lou Dort, snatch back and you know, a little step back, gets to the three-point line drains it probably could have been an and one there was a little contact after yeah there there was some contact there was they weren't blowing the whistle for anything late in this game had Jalen had the chance to even win it you know with the with the with the drive at the end of regulation went just off the I mean this this was insane and then the follow-up play after the three Madison a possession later 
They split. He splits two defenders, a superstar level play, right? Splits mm-hmm. two defenders and then gets to the rim and goes in between two <laughs> more defenders. He literally beat four Thunder defenders on <laughs> one possession for a bucket, a little 5-0 run by Jalen Green at the end of overtime to put this game away. This was easily the best game of his career. This was one of the best Rockets games that we've had in years. This felt like a postseason game. This felt like a playoff atmosphere Mm -hmm. game. You could tell the Rockets wanted this game. We're going to get into the actual game flow, how this thing started, just the up and the the back and the forth across this one, everything. We're going to unpack all of our additional thoughts. We've got to talk about a Min Thompson's incredible night, 25 and 15 from him. So much to get to on this one. How the Rockets managed to shut down Chet Holmgren and really frustrating him getting fouled out of this game, completely making him a non-factor in this game. We're going to talk about all that and so much more coming up in just one moment. First, today's episode is brought to you by Nissan. Are you the kind of driver that likes to push things a little further? Ever wonder what adventure could be around the very next corner? Well, our friends over at Nissan have a lineup of SUVs with the capabilities to take your adventure to the next level. The 2024 Nissan Rogue is perfect for city drives and great escapes. Class exclusive Google built-in is your always updating assistant to call on for almost anything. Gone are the days of connecting your phone. Google Assistant, Google Maps, and Google Play Store are built right into the 12.3 inch HD touchscreen right there at your fingertips. The 2024 Rogue is the perfect mid size crossover for your next adventure. Maybe you want a little bit more space though. The 2024 Nissan Pathfinder has room for up to eight an expansive cargo capacity and advanced available four by four capability with 284 horsepower and up to 6,000 pounds towing capacity. When adventure calls, the Pathfinder is there to answer. Take the Nissan Rogue, Nissan Pathfinder or Nissan Armada and go find your next big adventure. Shop NissanUSA.com. Today's episode is also brought to you by Amazon Fire TV. Fire TV is your destination for sports from live games to highlights to in-depth analysis. Fire TV offers amazing viewing experiences with smart TVs, as well as the Fire TV stick that you can plug into your existing TV that provides access to millions of movies and TV episodes, as well as free and live TV. Whether it's opening weekend for baseball or the college basketball tournament or NBA playoffs, you're going to want to have a Fire TV. Fire TV recently created Fire TV channels to deliver a constant supply of the latest videos from your favorite sports brands all for free. That includes all of us here at Locked On and most of the big pro leagues and college conferences as well. Fire TV channels lets you dive into all the game analysis, highlights, and more to keep up to date on all the latest in the world of sports. March Madness, NBA, MLB, and tons more. Not to mention great news, entertainment, gaming, travel, and cooking videos as well. Check out Fire TV channels on Fire TV and Alexa devices. If you haven't checked out Fire TV channels, you've got to check them out. To learn more, visit Amazon.com slash Locked on Fire TV. And continuing on here at Locked on Rockets, your daily podcast home for everything Houston Rockets basketball. Madison, this was a game that from the jump, the Rockets looked like a much better team. They, right out of the gate, 28 to 17 first quarter. They had shut down everybody that wasn't named Gordon Hayward. After 12 minutes, like that Gordon Edwards had eight points in that first quarter and he looked like the only Thunder player with a pulse after the first quarter. Rockets defense was switching everything. They were suffocating. Uh, It was a strong start from then. Fred Van Vliet had a quick like seven points in the first quarter, only scored six the rest of the way. Don't know exactly what happened to his offense as the game progressed. But I I mean, Credit to the Thunder, though, because they bounced back in a big way there in that second quarter, came back, uh, had a much stronger performance there. A a lot of this game felt like the Thunder bench was really integral in this game, right? And that's why the Thunder have been such a good team this season. They're one of the deepest teams in the NBA, and they were able to really rely on their bench. Um, Isaiah Joe with that... That detonation on Uncle Jeff uh, really, I think, ignited the thunder and kind of got them, you know, got them some juice, got them back into this game a little bit. Um, But that back and forth, man, right? It was all Rockets first quarter. It felt like it was kind of all thunder second quarter. And then that third quarter is where it became that back and forth show with Josh Giddy of all people who decided to just light the Rockets up. Like this was easily the best I've ever seen Josh Giddy play against the Rockets. Yeah, man. I, honestly, I, it was really disappointing to see our defense on Josh Giddy tonight. It seemed like if it wasn't Amon or Jalen guarding him, nobody could do anything with him. That was very disappointing. I was very disappointed in uh, Dylan Brooks' defense 
on uh on him and Jabari Smith's defense. They have to be better against against this guy. He just kind of walked his way into the paint and scored with and got whatever he wanted. But he was also kind of on one because he even made that shot where Jalen like almost forced the turnover and he's like laying on his back and makes the shot. He was sitting like, what the brain. hell, bro? You know, just like so, you know, when you're making stuff like that, it's like, oh, it's that it type of game. Night, right? but yeah, I, yeah. I, I kind of wonder if it's one of those where, like, right, Josh Giddy is is usually the guy at the bottom of, like, the pecking order offense. It, mm-hmm. You know, as far as, like, the defensive game plan, right, he's not really a guy that you're worried about shutting down. In fact, in the past, when the Rockets have played OKC, Ime Udoka has willingly given Josh Giddy wide open shots. He's been like, you know what? If you're going to beat us, cool, beat us. So I wonder if that was more so, like, he was the afterthought in the defensive game plan, and that's part of why he was able to get some of the easy looks that he got. Little, you know, very little resistance at times from the Rockets defenders because they just weren't expecting him to be as aggressive as he was. He had 15 points there in that third quarter, um, and, and he had 15 points in like six or seven minutes in that third quarter. He came out of the gate firing from halftime, and, and the again, I, I really think OKC did a great job of identifying. Hey, all right, we're gonna go to him, right? You're so worried about shutting down Chet. You're so worried about shutting. Down. Down. J-Dub, all right, we're going to go to Josh Giddy and see what he can do. Yeah, Giddy really Giddy really uh, had an amazing game and really kept his team, the uh, OKC, in it. And uh, Isaiah Joe, man, Isaiah, I, I just can't. Isaiah Joe hit so many timely threes that, you know, as soon as the Rockets tried to make their own run and try and create some distance, it seemed like Isaiah Joe would hit a quick three and just keep them, keep them with him, especially uh, in overtime. He hit like after Jalen hit that three, I feel like he hit a three like immediately after. I couldn't even celebrate. You know what I mean? Yeah. And it, it, it's like it, it was man, like a, that, they, that that overtime period felt like a heavyweight boxing match, right? right. Like just ba- like trading haymaker after haymaker, going back and forth, back and forth. It, it really did it did feel like no team either way. Nobody could create any separation, separation. until until overtime. Shout out to Dylan Brooks, who came into overtime and was just, he decided, all right, I'm going to drain the first three, cool, up three, and then came right back, drained a second three, and that, it was that second three where I started, I could breathe a little bit, right, where I was like, okay, all right, six point gate, like, I could I could feel it mm-hmm. a little bit, and then from there, I think the Rockets had all that momentum, Jabari, mm-hmm. I think, was their next bucket in overtime, hit that big three from the opposite corner of the, the one that he hit at the end of regulation, just a great, great resolve, great resiliency, by this Rockets team, right? Because they led, they had a big lead early. Thunder roared back in, took the lead in that third quarter. And it kind of felt like, okay, like you said, right? It's just, it felt like there were various points where it's like, okay, game's slipping away, right? Game, the, here's where the Thunder break it open, make it a 10 point game, 15 point game, whatever. And at no point, every time it felt like the reins were slipping a little bit, the Rockets had an answer. And a large part of that was, again, Jalen Green had a response every time. He had 17 points there in that third quarter. He had multiple little 5-0 runs where he had answers when OKC looked like they were starting to go on a run. And we got to give a lot of credit to Amin Thompson, who was right there to play, ready to play with Jalen Green, 25 and 15 in this game. 10 of 18 shooting. He was 5 of 6 at the free throw line, 4 assists, 1 steal. A learning opportunity for Amin Thompson at the end of regulation because we know that this is a Rockets team. We know that Emo Doka is a coach that likes to foul when up three. The Rockets did have a foul to give on that final possession. They used it, but then there was a bit of a miscommunication uh-huh. that led to the J-Dub three-pointer to tie things up. And and you could tell when the camera panned back over to the bench uh, during the timeout, Amin was pissed. He was mad at himself because he knew that he mixed up the coverage and that he knew he was supposed to foul and didn't. I love what Ryan Holland said, though, right? No crying over spilled milk. It happened. Now what do you do, right? How do you respond? You got to finish this game out. And the Rockets did that. Yeah, I thought I, even on that play, I, I still thought, he got a really good contest. He like, it, it was just that first dribble that, that J-Dub, and at the end of the day, J-Dub is a great player. J-Dub is a great player, and great players make great plays. And yes, we want we want to get that, uh, that assignment, but I'll give him a break on that because he was excellent defensively all game. And I felt like when Jalen didn't have it in certain, in certain areas, Amon's energy on the board, activity, activity on the boards, really made some timely shots. There was one broken play where the Rockets, I think, were down like six. And they I were, just, they were down they were down five, 109, 104. A man got the rebound off yes. of Jalen Green air ball and he dribbled it around the kind of around the top yes. of the key. And then 
elevated for a midi, and he yeah. and he's the, and hit, hit it, it. And, he, and he cut it to a three point game like that, like those little timely buckets, right? Mm-hmm. He showed up in those little moments when they needed him to, and, and nobody called to play for him. That was just pure hustle. That was just. I'm in being I'm in. And, that, and that type of stuff, that is the type of stuff that just, you know, when you're a star player and Jalen Green, it feel like feels like he's doing everything, everything, everything. Can I get some help? Can I get some help? You know what I mean? And and a guy said, I got you. You, you didn't have that one. Let me go ahead and make a play for you real quick. You know what I'm saying? It gives you the gas, that energy you need to continue to feel it, uh finish these games. Like you said, like you said, when Isaiah Joe detonated on, on Jeff Green. It changed the the energy of the game, and that's and that is what Amon often does for these Rockets. Well, that that's what jo, uh, Jalen did all night tonight, and that's what Amon also uh, put his own finishing touches on the game with 15 rebounds, guys. This is a wing. This is supposed to be our future point guard. 15 rebounds in a in a in this type of game. You know what I mean? Uh, in this economy, and, right? <laughs> in this type of, but I'm just saying, like a playoff style game, like that's what we expect to see. Just making an impact in any way he can. Uh, Got to give him his flowers. And it really, I mean, not only was Amin active on the boards, right? Jalen was active on the boards. Like oh, there yeah. were moments Bro. where, uh, so 15, uh, Amin led all rebounders in this game. I believe I'm double checking, led all rebounders with 15. And then Jalen Green was the Rockets' second highest rebound man with nine. Those are your guards getting after it on the glass. That is impressive stuff. I really liked early on that they did this a couple times in the game. I really wish we had gotten to see a little bit more of it. Um, but where they used and they've done it, uh, you know, over the last little stretch, using a men as a facilitator out of the post, right? Get him on a post up and then ha- running little actions off of that. They did it for one of the first couple plays of the game, uh, and I think it resulted in one of Fred's early. Uh, it might have been Fred's only three pointer. Maybe it was one where it was a two point. I think it was his only three pointer. He's one of seven from downtown. Uh, but Fred kind of came curling off a screen and caught the pass off of from a man Thompson. I believe that that was the early play of the game. But just seeing the different ways in which Ime Odoka is utilizing him as a facilitator, using him as kind of that connective tissue piece offensively. We know that they've used him as a screener. We know that they use him kind of probing the baseline, sitting in the dunker spot, waiting to kind of clean up different opportunities. Six of his rebounds, six of his 15 were offensive boards, right? Little putbacks, little extra chance possessions, little tap outs, all those little hustle plays, right? And Again, yeah, he might have had the mix-up at the end of regulation, but that's a great learning moment for Amin Thompson. And one of the really cool things about him as a rookie is we rarely see him make the same mistake twice, right? Like when he makes a mistake, he internalizes it, and he doesn't make that same mistake again. This was a crucial learning moment for him. Thankfully, it didn't result in a Rockets loss. They were still able to come away with the win. Uh, but my God, this this was such a hell of a game. Uh, we've got final thoughts on this one coming up here in just a moment. We'll give you an update on the standings as uh, unfortunately the Miami Heat and the Orlando Magic didn't do the Rockets any favors against the Warriors, unfortunately. Uh, but final thoughts from this game coming up here in just one moment. First, today's episode is brought to you by Better Help. Sometimes we all need the opportunity to get something off our chest, big or small. Certain things can really start to get to you. It's important to let that stuff out, especially to someone who's unbiased when it comes to your life. Because look, maybe you had, uh, you know, you got into a, mistake or a problem at work and you got chewed out by your boss, that can kind of weigh on you. Or maybe it's a a personal thing, right? With a a, a close friend or a loved one or a partner and you had a disagreement and you just don't really know how to, you know, resolve that conflict. You need to be able to unpack those emotions in a healthy and cathartic way. I've done therapy in the past and had it be, it's really felt like a, a, a great experience to have somebody who is unbiased when it comes to your life to just kind of help walk you through some of the things that you're dealing with. Therapy can be different for everyone. And honestly, most of us have bigger problems than what's going on with our favorite sports teams and chasing the 10th seed in the Western Conference. And it's important to get those things off your chest every once in a while. So if you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be flexible and suited to your schedule. Visit betterhelp.com slash locked on NBA to get 10% off of your first month. That's better help help.com slash locked on MBA. And final segment here at Locked On Rockets, your daily podcast home for everything Houston Rockets basketball. Now, Madison, I, I know I teased it up there for segment two. We wound up not getting to it, but we got to talk about this. I thought that, right, first meet up between these two teams, Alper and Shingun completely like just outplayed Chet Holmgren, right? Like stuffed him in a locker you know, whatever weight room, all the, all, all the different proverbs you want to throw out. Um, 
then Chet Holmgren got the better in the next two meetups. And he was absolutely dominant the last two times these two teams played. This game, the Rockets completely flummoxed Chet Holmgren. He only got two shot attempts. They were both from long distance. He finished with two points, seven rebounds. He had three blocks on the defensive end, and he was a little active, you know, rejecting shots in and around the rim when he was in the game. But he only played 18 minutes because he was in foul trouble all night long, a combination of the Rockets going at him, them identifying, hey, okay, cool. If we attack Chet, if we get him in foul trouble, then he'll have to ride the bench, right? And that'll open things up for us. It'll open up our ability to attack the rim. OKC isn't a big team, right? They're not like Chet Holmgren's not a traditional big man. And I think that this matchup really favored the Rockets with their new kind of identity without Shingun to where they were able to play small at certain times. And they guarded Chet the same way that they've guarded Wimby in the past by using Dylan Brooks and even Jay Sean Tate as like the primary defenders on Chet Holmgren. And it really bothered him. Like he did not have the muscle to deal with either of those guys. There was that one possession where Jay Sean Tate came over as the help side defender and came over and doubled Chet Holmgren when he was in the middle of the spin move towards the paint and just ripped the ball away from him because he just can't deal with that. Like, he just doesn't have the strength yet in his career, you know, at this point in his career. Yeah, I thought what that their game plan for Chet was excellent. He also didn't play a lot on the court, but I think in the short times that he played, I thought they were active with their hands defensively with wings on him, like you said. Um, I, there was a lot of times where we forced turnovers when Chet had the ball, when he was going to initiate offense at the top of the, uh, the three-point line in the key. Um, I thought, uh, I think Fred got a quick hand rip on him as well, but – uh, more importantly, I think the Rockets' ball movement uh, really initiated and got Chet in, in foul trouble. I, there was some there was some good dump downs to uh, to Landale, who used uh, his body to get into Chet, and and soon as Chet came back in, every time we found a way to attack his body and get him into foul trouble. And I also thought Amon's activity um, on one of the rebounds got him one of those early quick fouls that he wasn't expecting to get. But it's just the the activity and the energy and the physicality that the Rockets play with. Now, it seems like they only call fouls on Chet Homer because we didn't get not one other call all game, but I'm okay with that. I'm actually okay with that. I think I know that's a big topic for the Rockets fans about the, the way the calls win, especially Jalen's last call at the end of the game. But I'm okay with the way this game was called because it was called evenly. I think both teams are equally upset at the calls at the end of the game. I mean, there were some times where J-Dub was absolutely mugged down there and, and he didn't get uh, not one whistle. It was you know a what I mean? crazy physical yeah. game. Yeah, it was very, very physical. But that's I, I like it that way. I, I prefer it that way. And when you have that type of physical physical game, that's when those mid-rangers come in handy, man. I'm, I'm sure the mid range is going to come back in a huge way now that the physicality is increased but yeah a great by great great for the Rockets to get Chet out of the game because it really opened up the floor for the guys to still get downhill it's still tough in there because we don't get no calls but at least it, at least that threat is a lot bigger and, and guys have to kind of gang protect the, uh, the paint instead of just letting Chet roam free yeah J- Jalen Williams is a much different uh, interior presence interior big man than than Chet Holmgren is again they don't have a, a legit backup big once Chet Holmgren's out that's it you're, you're basically playing a small ball lineup which again I think kind of favored the Rockets a little bit shout out to uh, the saucy Aussie himself Jock Landale for uh, being the one to draw that sixth foul on mm-hmm. Chet Holmgren got him with a pump fake in the air and then Chet Holmgren was bye bye it's funny because right because he had to sit when he picked up that fifth foul he checked back into the game and he was in the game for like I think less than like a minute or something Maybe Maybe two minutes tops before he picked up that six foul. And then he had just, he was bye bye, sayonara, you're done for the game. Um, I will say the free throw thing was so weird because OKC, I think, had 15 free throw attempts and the Rockets mm-hmm. still had zero in this game. And I don't know if that was like, this was like such a weird game, Madison, where first off, I, I don't know if we missed like a league wide memo about like offensive fouls. Screens. I don't remember the last time I saw this many offensive fouls called in an NBA game. Yeah, man. And especially the screens, they 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 had to be a record. There, there must have been uh 10 moving screen calls between the two teams. And I feel like the Rockets got five in the first half. Like, and then uh I think OKC got about two or three in the second half, and I say, okay, it's even and out. And that's what and that's what I look for when at the at halftime there was a huge free throw discrepancy, huge free throw discrepancy. 
discrepancy. But I figured, hey, refs are gonna get that sheet, <laughs> that, that sheet, and they're gonna see that discrepancy and say, hey, we gotta even this thing out. And I did think it actually evened out. And so I was okay. I was I was okay with the Jalen no call at the end. You know, it, it wasn't like they called a charge. You know what I mean? It, they can choose to have a no call. And Jalen at the end of the day, you're our superstar player. You finish this game, but you got to make that layup. That's a layup that's makeable for you. But I like the aggressiveness. I like the the fact that you took it uh, strong to the rim. And next time that'll fall. It was just, I mean, it barely, yeah, missed it, like, it rolled hanging. off the rim. And I call like when, when the Rockets had that hand of like, what, 4.3 left on the clock or whatever. I was like, I'm feeling it. Like, did, like the stage is set for a Jalen Green game yeah. winner, right? He dished it on the play before to Jabari. Like that was a bit, that was a big boy play. That was a superstar level play, a great read. Now the stage is set for you to go get yours, to go get your bucket. And I mean, it was right there. Like, oh my God, I wanted that to drop so bad. That, that would have been an insane finish. I'm not, I'm not mad about the finish we got. But seeing that fall, seeing that layup go in would have been just a chef's kiss on an incredible game. Um, he's going to make it next time, though. Just the fact that he was even able to get there, right? When when you have a moment like that where you the entire – everybody in that gym knew that Jalen was going to take that shot at that point, right? Sometimes you just have one of those moments, and yet mm -hmm. somehow the star players still make it happen. And it was, it was so close to going in. It wasn't like he missed it by a mile. Yeah, it yeah. wasn't like he settled for a three or it a pull-up midi. He got right there to the rim exactly where he wanted to go, and there was nothing that the OKC defense could do about it. It. Um, man, I'm trying to make sure I'm trying to f remember where else we got to go with this because we got we had a few we had a couple more things that we wanted to talk about in this segment. I had it in my notes. I'm trying to make sure I don't forget anything. Oh, the standings. Um, if there's uh, anything, no. it, 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 if there's anything else that you have you want to add from this game, Madison, before we before we move to a quick update on the standings, I don't think. Oh, Jabari, we wanted to talk about Jabari a little well, just, bit. Yeah, I mean, oh yes, okay. So, but yeah, uh, that's right, Jabari. Okay, so. Jabari, great, strong finish to this game. But the Rockets and this team are becoming a lot better, a lot quicker, okay? And Jabari, you've taken the pseudo leap this year, and we're proud for your improvement. But now when you get into this level of competition and this level of game, it's all about the details, right? So we need, we need Jabari to understand where his spots on the floor are, um, how the offense is flowing and kind of fill out the game and where, when and where to pick your spots. I felt like we really needed Jabari's offense at the top of the second quarter when both Fred Van Vliet and Jalen Green was off. And that's when all the detonation got and, and the Thunder went on their run. And that there was like four or five possessions where Jabari didn't even touch the ball, nor did he, they run a play or Jabari actually demand the ball. Those were your opportunities to get yourself going, Jabari. You are the offensive of Fulcrum. And I just kind of felt like he fell asleep in, in, in that moment. And then when, once the guards came in, he tried to be a bit more aggressive. But in no, in a, in a tough game like this, we had every possession counts. And so it, it was one of those – there was a couple plays where he just, you know, kind of lost himself in, in the rhythm of the game, right? One time he traveled when he needed to – after securing the board, he, he should have passed it up quick. So we can so we can get out and running. It's about pace. That's the way the Rockets are playing. And even though you can dribble Jabari, that doesn't always mean it's the best thing for the team, right? And so it's just understanding what the team needs from you in those moments. This is a uh, this is a game tonight tonight where the OKC Thunder is very small. You finish with three rebounds. We have to be better from our center. You know what I mean? And Jabari's having an excellent season. I don't want to bag on Jabari. He closed his game with, with uh, ice cold blood in his veins. You know what I mean? But these are the type of things that we need more consistency from Jabari, more attention to detail from Jabari, so that this team can reach its potential this year. And I know it's in him. When, when you start kind of getting to this territory, right? When you start getting into the mm -hmm. into the territory that this Rockets team is approaching, right? Where you're starting to, you know, you're in the playing discussion. You want to start playing, ideally, some postseason, you know, basketball, all that stuff. You have to look for what are the ways this team can improve, right? And, and Jabari has taken a leap this year. He's been incredible. This has been a great year, too, for him. But there's absolutely still areas for him to improve in his game. And, and you know, for from it, it's just kind of weird, right? Because you have, you know, that stretch where he was so dominant on the glass. And then you have games like this where 
where it feels like he disappears when it comes to the rebounding. And so I don't know what goes in, you know, on a game by game basis for Jabari, but I, I fully agree with you, right? Needed more from him on the glass in this game. I will say my one caveat is with how aggressive the Rockets are at times with their switching, sometimes he's not in position to rebound, right? Like if he's on the perimeter, switched out onto a guard, whatever he has to, maybe has to close out on a three point shooter, whatever it may be. That could also be why we saw a and Jalen have such strong rebounding nights. So mm-hmm. it's not like the Rockets themselves were like actually, I guess like hurting on the glass in this game. They actually rebounded. Okay. Out, out rebounded. OKC okay, 50 to 49. So it's not like they were getting crushed on the glass because Jabari wasn't rebounding, but you mm-hmm. would expect your six eleven seven foot big man mm-hmm. to be a little bit more active on the glass. So maybe it's a scheme thing. Maybe it's a little bit of both where he needs to be a little bit more, more focused on that rebounding department of his game. Um, I'm glad you brought up the turnover from Jabari because it did feel like the Rockets over the course of this game. And they, they, they ironed it out as the game got mm-hmm. towards the end, right? They started really taking care of the basketball executing in you know in crunch time end of regulation in you know in in overtime for sure but it felt like early on there were some kind of sloppy like unforced turnovers the Jabari travel was one of them mentioned the Jay Sean Tate steal that he had on Chet Holmgren he immediately tried to pass the ball ahead to Aaron Holiday and Aaron Holiday wasn't paying attention for it little miscommunication between those two guys but those are some of those like unforced errors that you just cannot have when the margin for error is so razor thin against a good team right like if if SGA had been playing in this game don't know what this game would have looked like we're not going to play that hypothetical here but it's just one of those where you cannot give you cannot gift wrap OKC extra opportunities because of those right. Like OKC is already a good team; they're going to force plenty of turnovers themselves. They're going to force you into some tough, tough shots, some tough defensive possessions. So you have to value every single possession. So I'm glad you brought that one up. Um, I don't think I have anything else from this game. I mean, it was it, yeah. I, I think we covered every little angle from this one. Um, yeah, man, this was. It feels so good to have a game like this to talk about, man. Like, I know we were talking about it before we hit the record button, but just to have this level of competition back, to have this level of basketball back, Craig and Ryan were talking about it on the broadcast, right? The rebuild has been tough on everybody. Mm-hmm. So to be like, to, to see the fruits of the rebuilding labor kind of play out in front of our very eyes and to see a game like this take place, probably the, the biggest game in the last few years, the biggest game since the James Harden era for this Rockets team uh, and to come out with a win in an overtime game felt incredible. Incredible. Now, I will say that, unfortunately, Rockets did not gain momentum in the standings because the Golden State Warriors took a trip down to Florida and both the Miami Heat and the Orlando Magic sold because they lost both games against the Golden State Warriors. Like, this was a back-to-back in Florida, and not one of those teams could step up and hand the Warriors a loss. I got beef with the Heat. I got beef with the Magic. What the hell? These are good basketball teams. They couldn't step up for one game against Golden State? I was killing you, man. East is some chumps, man. Y'all, y'all some chumps out there out east, man. Well, the, the West, it's, it's a dog fight. We we over 511 seed over here in the West, man. And y'all chumps, Draymond didn't even play tonight, Orlando. Like, he, he, he tried to give you the game and you couldn't take it, man. It, it's okay. We'll go get it ourselves. <laughs> That's okay. We'll go get it ourselves on April 4th. Oh, man, that April 4th game is going to be a movie. I cannot wait for it. That's going to be the biggest game of this Rockets rebuild to date once we get to April 4th. But we want to know how you feel about this game. We want to know your reaction to Jalen Green's superstar performance against OKC, this huge Rockets win, their 10th win in a row, their 10th 10-game or more winning streak in franchise history. Uh, the first 10-game winning streak that they've had since the James Harden era. We want your thoughts on all of that in the YouTube comments. If you're watching, if you're listening, drop us some thoughts there. Madison, you know the drill. Let me know where to track you down at. Find me on Twitter at, at MadmanLeaks. Come talk Rockets basketball with me. That's going to do it for another edition of Locked on Rockets. As always, thank you so much for checking out the show. If you haven't done so yet, please consider subscribing wherever you listen to your podcast or on YouTube. Just search Locked on Rockets. Be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. And if you're listening on Apple Podcasts, try and drop us a five-star review. It does help us out a ton. But as always, thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for listening. And we look forward to having you back right here at Locked on Rockets, your daily podcast home for everything Houston Rockets basketball. 